Hello and welcome to week 13 of Introduction to Psychology. Today we're going to be talking about personality. And again, as with most things in psychology, we need to take a biopsychosocial approach. You know, for example, how does our personality influence our by our genetics? Do we have this genetic tendency towards specific behavior, a specific way of thinking? How much of our personality is based upon the structure of our brain and cognition, the way we think, the way we interpret information, the way we perceive stimuli and categorize information, categorize our memories to make sense of reality? And then how much of our personality was molded, socialized in the social context, influenced by others, and also us modeling and imitating their behavior? You know, so when you talk about personality, again, biopsychosocial is the best approach. Okay. So to begin with, the definition of personality, the consistent ways in which the behavior of one person differs from that of others, especially in social situations. So again, when you want to look at unique traits of personality, what separates us from other people are these significant differences. Again, we're going to talk about the theories. We're going to look at psychoanalytic theory or psychodynamic theory. We're going to look at individualistic or humanistic psychology. We're going to look at social cognitive uh, psychology with social learning. Uh, but to begin, we'll talk about Sigmund Freud. So again, a little bit of our early psychologists. Again, we need to take a lot of things with a grain of salt, take the good ideas, and then kind of dismiss the bad. And when it comes to Freud, some of his ideas are revolutionary, such as the study of unconscious mind and the theories of the self, for example, that are incredibly applicable to modern times. But then a lot of it we need to question, such as the psychosexual phases of development and some of his you know, approaches toward children and theories about children, for example, that might be dismissed in modern times. But overall, psychodynamic theory, the basis of this is that kind of mixing of your unconsciousness and your consciousness. That's what makes you up. Your unconscious biological drives, your unconscious processes, influence and in interacting with your conscious mind, your aware sense of you, okay? So that's psychodynamic theory is, again, combining the inner forces with the social context. So Freud used psychoanal psychoanalysis to really search and seek out what was happening in the unconscious. And then he would treat patients, again, using more like talk therapy, bringing out this stuff to the surface, for example. So for Freud, the idea was figuring out who you were and figuring out your anxiety was to understanding your deeper, darker self, for example, your unconscious, the unknown, the things that we can't really access, okay? So what is really happening in our unconscious mind and how is that influencing our conscious mind, which is then influencing how we're behaving and thinking in the social context, for example. Uh, so again, this is one of Freud's biggest ideas is that this unconscious mind, this two-track mind between the unconscious and the consciousness, the unconsciousness is driving us and we might not even know it. And that's why I love that chapter we did on the unconscious versus the conscious mind is because you're always asking yourself, well, who's really driving me? What's really motivating me? You know, why am I behaving in this way? Is this my body and my cells driving me and motivating me to go out and find food and to go out and find water, take care of basic security needs and attachment needs and sexual needs, for example? Or how much of me is my consciousness, you know, my aware side? How much of me is in control who actually is in control, you know? And so he really starts to get at some of these great questions, okay? So again, Freud, some of the big critiques is, you know, he started to look at childhood sexual issues and he started looking at the psychosocial phases, as you see here, with the oral stage, anal, phallic, latent, and genital stage. But again, a lot of this is questionable. And so this is the kind of stuff with Freud where it's very interesting to read about dream theory and, you know, the psychosexual development, but is it accurate to our modern lifespan developmental psychology, for example? And again, that's where you have to take some of it with a grain of salt, but still interesting to read. One of Freud's biggest um, offerings is this idea of the three interrelated parts of the mind, the id, the ego, and the superego. So the id is like your inner self, that unconscious, that drive, all that motivation, the emotion, all of that. That's your inner personality, okay? Your superego is like your social self, okay? Your thing that's aware of the environment, your surroundings, and always constantly engaging in impressions to you know, get what you want in the social context. And your ego is kind of that middle ground, the moderator between the id and the superego, okay? 
So again, I like to use an analogy like this. Like say you're out somewhere, you're at a coffee shop, you see someone that you think is attractive, you would like to introduce yourself and you know get to know that person a little bit more, you'd like to take them on a date, whatever it might be. So your id might be screaming out like, go talk to that person, go over there, go buy them a, you know, a coffee or whatever it might be. And your super ego is like, whoa, dude, hold on. That's not how you get a girl. The way to get someone, for example, is you got to go up and be all nice and you got to be calm and not be too overbearing and not too much pressure. And your ego is the one moderating this conversation between your inner self and your social self. Your inner self, your id, your super ego, your social self, and your ego is the one moderating between these two systems. So again, this is like the three parts of the mind. You have your inner self, you know, that's driving you, your social self, your super ego that's analyzing all the context and figuring out how you should behave, and then your ego is moderating between the two. Okay, really cool ideas. I talk about that a lot. So some of the classic defense mechanisms against anxiety Freud also introduces. But again, a lot of this is based upon our behavior and our personality type and our overall traits and you know how we think and how we behave, for example. So Freud talks about defense mechanisms, which the goal of defense mechanisms is to reduce anxiety. So with repression, that's the idea of pushing information from our consciousness back into our, con our unconscious, such as with traumatic events. Uh, to deny something, to just not even want to look at the reality of a situation because it's overwhelming to think about, to rationalize something, which is to justify our actions. Uh, displacement is to put your behavior on top of somebody else, for example. Uh, regression is when you return to like a childhood state. Projecting is when you try to put your emotions and you blame it on somebody else. So like they say you're angry and you turn around and say, no, you're angry, okay? Uh, reaction formation, presenting oneself is the opposite. So, you know, if you really have this desire to go up and talk to somebody in a coffee shop and maybe your sex drive is telling you to go up and, you know, try to hold their hand and kiss them, you can't just walk up and kiss someone or hold their hand. You have to get consent. You have to go meet them. You got to go hang out with them. So someone who might be really driven to like, you know, go up and just kiss someone they just met because that person is so attractive. For example, the reaction formation stops you from doing that behavior and causes you to do another behavior because you know the other behavior that you might want to go engage in is inappropriate, for example. And then sublimation, again, is this idea of transforming these behaviors into something that's culturally acceptable. So after Freud, you get kind of these neo-Freudians that go beyond a little bit of the sexual ideas that Freud was very focused on. And they start to look at things like the unconscious and the conscious mind at a much deeper level, okay? So here you have uh, Karen Hornet, you have Alfred Adler, you have Carl, Carl Jung, and they're all offering up some of these ideas about the unconscious mind and really how it works. One of the most interesting is The Collective Unconscious by Carl Jung. And this is the idea of do our genetics after we have the, actually have these past memories, for example. And what we're finding is no, our genes don't have necessarily past memories because how do you encode memories in genes? Uh, but they do have these tendencies toward behavioral traits that do drive us in a certain way. And again, these are the behavioral traits that have survived over thousands of years. So there's some really good information there. Uh, so then the Neo-Freudians really start to get into this idea of just individual psychology, okay? This idea of beginning to focus on the whole person more than just, you know, the sum of its parts. So instead of looking at just the unconscious and just the conscious, you have to look at the entire person, which involves the biology and the psychology and the sociology of a person, for example, okay? So you really start to get some beautiful ideas that come out of this. And this is kind of what leads to this idea of humanistic psychology. And again, humanistic psychology is this idea of really focusing on self-efficacy and self-esteem and self-actualization and you know, self-transcendence and becoming the most ful fulfilling the person that you could potentially be, okay? So humanistic psychology starts to treat the entire person, all the situations, all the interacting parts and how it works, okay? Really interesting side of psychology. Uh, Carl Rogers comes along and talks about unconditional positive regard. And again, this is the idea that all of us want to have a positive impression of ourselves. It's 
seemingly that we want to be happy. And so how do we help people achieve these positive goals? How do we help people fulfill what they were meant to do with their life, okay? And then Abraham Maslow, you know, coins this incredible idea of self-actualization. Again, as we talked about before, once our basic needs like security are met, our attachment needs are met, and then we start to focus on things like fulfilling our potential, living the best life that we possibly can. And that's the idea of actualization, is once you've lived up to your fullest potential, you've done everything you wanted to do in your life. That's the idea of you know feeling complete, feeling self-actualized. And then he goes beyond that and he talks about self-transcendence and that's the idea of now finding meaning. Once you've fulfilled all the potential in your life, then you have to turn around and find the meaning attached to your life. That's the overall approach. So when we're going to study personality, we can look at a nomothetic approach. And this is the idea of looking at general personality traits. And then you have the ideographic approach, which starts to look at very much more specific traits, for example. Okay. So when we look at personality traits, again, we're taking a biopsychosocial approach. How much of our personality is based in our genetics? Do our genetics influence the way we behave, the way we think? And absolutely they do. Okay. We all have these genetic traits that influence the way our brain works and then how we interact in the social context, for example, okay? So traits are simply consistent tendencies and behaviors. Do dogs share, share common traits? Do cats share common traits? So then think about it, do humans share common traits? A common way of behaving. And there are these underlying universal behavior mechanisms that do exist, okay? But then again, when we start to look at a more specific, what is it about specific individuals that makes them different from somebody else? And that's where you start to look into the social context, okay? And that's what really affects us, are these individual uh, interactions that we have in our life. And it's not even so much how our parents raise us. I mean, the book talks about how your parents raising you has almost no influence on your personality. What does is these other factors in the social context. So what trumps the way you behave? You know, how much is genetics driving you in your unconscious? And then how much is your social context experience and your unconscious and conscious interpretation of your social context experiences? How much of that becomes your personality? Okay. So again, we are looking at these ideas of broad personality traits, but again, these personality traits are so hindered on the social context in your own personal experiences in the social context, okay? Again, it's that balance between nature and nurture, okay? So again, humanistic psychology starts to introduce these ideas of self-esteem uh, versus self-efficacy. Self-esteem being evaluating ourself, what's our sense of self-worth, and then, uh, Self-efficacy being evaluating our self-competence. How competent are we at achieving a task, for example? And so these are very important aspects of your personality. How do you feel about yourself? How do you measure yourself? How does that influence your behavior, for example, okay? So the big models of personality, the most important one is this idea of the five-factor model of personality, and that the most happy personalities in general are these are those individuals that have a personality that is emotionally stable, uh, extroverted, agreeable, conscientious, open. But the idea in the end is that all of us, none of us are totally emotionally stable or totally extroverted or always agreeable or always conscientiousness or always conscientious of other people, okay, or open. The idea is all of us are kind of somewhere in the middle. You know, the happiest, truly happiest people that measure themselves the most happy are generally those ones that are in the middle somewhere between extroverted and introverted. People don't always like the most introverted or the most extroverted person, okay? The most extroverted outgoing person can be overwhelming because they never stop talking, for example, <laughs> right? Okay, but again, you know, that's the idea is we need to find that balance between everything and become a balanced human, you know? So again, how much does heredity environment influence your environment? Um, how much does heredity influence you, and how much does environment influence you? Again, is that biopsychosocial question? How much are your genetics driving you? Because when you look at twin studies, there are a lot of overlaps. But then when you look at 
siblings, not as much overlap. And then when you look at siblings that are biological versus siblings that are adopted, you find almost no overlap. So again, we're tending to realize that we all have a genetic potential. And yes, we are influenced by our genes. But the most important thing is that epigenetic idea of the social context influencing us more so maybe than genetics because again the social context affects how your genes express themselves for example okay so the social context the social environment the nurturing part of it is incredibly important when it comes to um you know our personality development okay so our personality tends to become more solid over time and as you find that when people are young, their personality is not totally formed. It's still evolving, and that happens in a teenage and younger life as you're still experiencing new things and formulating you know, all your memories and putting them all together into what kind of a personality you have, for example. What is the story of your life? What is the story of yourself? And as you grow older, you tend to have a more concrete personality that doesn't change as much as it does when you were young, for example, okay? The book talks a lot about personality tests, and again, personality tests must be taken with a grain of salt. Personality tests are great for guiding us and kind of leading us toward a subject, but personalities tend not to be very accurate in the end, okay? So again, personality tests can kind of hint at or suggest that there's a potential that someone's schizophrenic, for example, but that just tells the psychologist they need to go investigate further, not necessarily that, that person is schizophrenic. So again, personality tests are useful for helping us as a tool to help with diagnosis, to help figuring out what's going on with somebody, but it's never an end-all be-all and it's not 100% accurate. And as with all testing, including intelligence testing, we should be questioning across the board. What is it measuring? Is it reliable? Is it accurate? Okay. So there's a lot of issues with both of the major tests, the uh, MMPI and also the Myers-Briggs, okay? Um, the Rorschach ink block test, that's always classic in psychology, okay? There is almost no validity to those, okay? So when someone shows you a picture and they say, you know, what does it remind you of, for example, we found there's almost no validity to that. So we need to question all of our tests. So again, personality, as with everything in psychology, is very hard to measure because so much of it's based on self-report. Yeah, you can do observations, you can look at genetics, but genetics doesn't tell you like what gene is responsible for a personality, because the way it works is it's tons of genes all interacting that influence your genetic personality, okay? You can't just look at one thing. So again, it's not the sum of its parts, you gotta look at how all the parts interact in order to understand the whole, okay? So again, it's like a car engine. You can't just look at all the pieces and take them all apart and figure out what they do. You don't really understand all the car parts until you put it all together and see how they all work together to make the car run. And that's the same thing with positive or humanistic psychology, for example, okay? I mean, again, we have some good personality tests such as the implicit bias test like we talked about last week with prejudice and discrimination, but even those results are just hinting. They're just suggesting that we all lean toward one way. It's not an end-all be-all measure of bias and implicit ways of thinking, for example, okay? So again, this idea that personalities can be, tests can be misused, mishandled, they're using the court system a lot, and that can really affect people's lives, for example. So again, we should always question our measures, okay? Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this idea of personality. We got some really good discussions for you. Uh, if you have any questions, please email, and thank you so much.